In this video, we'll go through an example showing how we can use the general solution to Laplace's equation in cylindrical coordinates to solve a problem in uh, heat distribution. So for this problem, we have a semi-infinite solid cylinder of radius A, where its curved surface is held at a temperature of zero degrees Celsius, and its base is held at a temperature T naught. And we're interested in finding the steady state temperature distribution in the cylinder. So because it's, uh, we're looking at the steady state temperature, uh, this is described by Laplace's equation. And the picture to have in mind over here is the following. So we choose a coordinate system like this, where we have the base of the radius of the, of the cylinder over here. And this cylinder extends to negative z, to a, sorry, to positive uh, infinity along the z axis. It has a radius a. We're told that the curved surface, so this over here, u at a theta and z is zero. And we're told that the bottom over here you are z is equal to zero is equal to t naught. So all along the disk, this disk over here, uh, which is at z equals zero, the temperature is t naught. So because we already found the general solution to Laplace's equation in cylindr cylindrical coordinates, we can start with that. And we're going to start uh, just with one of the infinitely many solutions. So there's no superposition yet. This was given by a uh, radial component. We can put subscripts M and N. This is multiplied by a angular component. And finally, this is multiplied by the axial component. Like this. So this is one of the infinitely many solutions that we found to our problem. And before superimposing the solutions, we want to see if there's any terms that we can get rid of right away, just based on the physical constraints of the problem. So the first point that we can make is because we're dealing with a physical quantity like temperature. Then you cannot tend to infinity or can't blow up anywhere. In particular, because this is a semi-infinite cylinder, so it can go all the way to positive infinity, we have to get rid of this term over here because as said tends to infinity, this term will also tend to infinity. So this means that to stop that from happening, we need to set F is equal to zero to get rid of this term. This should, I guess, have subscripts n. Because this term tends to infinity as z goes to infinity. 
the second thing we can get rid of is because r is equal to zero is a possible value for the radius, we need to get rid of our Bessel function of the second kind over here. So if you recall from the last video, these functions diverge as its argument tends to zero. Okay, so this will also tend to infinity as r goes to zero. So as we get close to the origin. So to stop that from happening, we set its coefficient b equal to zero. Additionally, based on this boundary condition, which tells us what happens all along the curved surface, so for any angle, this does not depend on the angle at all. So there's a polar symmetry to, uh, to this problem that we can exploit. So there's no angular dependence. Then that means that we can set m equal to zero everywhere because that will get rid of sine and that will just leave a constant over here, which is what we saw uh, before uh, when we consider uh, the case m is equal to zero. The angular component just contributes a, an extra constant. So we've gotten rid of this term We've essentially gotten rid of these, just left a constant that we can in, uh, uh, integrate into another constant. And we've gotten rid of this term. So we're left with a solution uh, that has this general form. We'll call our uh, integration constant, or uh, sorry, our constant to be determined as a n prime. Uh, we set m is equal to zero. So the only Bessel function that's left is the zeroth order one. And we also have this decaying exponential term over here. Okay, so whatever solution we find, we know it has to be of this form based on our boundary conditions. Another thing that we can do is we actually never used this first boundary condition. We just used it to say that there's no data dependence, so m has to equal to zero, but we never explicitly used it. Now, We can explicitly plug that into our general solution here. To get this condition. Uh, because this term is always, uh, is never equal to, uh, to zero, strictly speaking, we can bring it over to the other side. And we're left with this condition based on this boundary condition. And once again, there's two ways to satisfy this, either our coefficients a and prime are equal to zero, which just means nothing happens, or this Bessel function of zeroth order has to be zero. And we'll take that condition to be satisfied. 
So this has to be equal to zero. And this happens at the zeros of the Bessel function. Okay, so that means this is equal to zero. And these are just, uh, you can normally find them in tables. And so these are just the numerical values of uh, the Bessel functions and there's uh, infinitely many of them because it, it oscillates and we'll call them uh, alpha n. So that means that our constant kn is equal to the zeros of the Bessel function of order zero divided by the radius of our cylinder. Okay, so again, from this condition, we were able to find what this constant Kn was equal to. It means equal to the zeros of the Bessel function divided by the radius of the cylinder. So we can update our solution with that. Now we have that Alpha R. Okay, so alpha n, so these are the values of Kn. Which we just substituted into our solution. And there's no m anymore because we just said m is equal to zero. Okay, so uh, this is the general form of the nth solution. We can then apply the second boundary condition, which says that at the base of the cylinder, the temperature is equal to a constant T naught. When set is equal to zero, uh, this term goes to one. So we're left with, with this condition to be satisfied. And once again, there's no way to satisfy this condition. Uh, it should be UN. Um, so we need to superimpose our solutions because uh, you need something that's a function of R to be equal to a constant. So we need to superimpose our solutions to satisfy this boundary condition. So that means summing all of our solutions from n is equal to one to infinity, a and prime. And this we can set equal to T naught. And just as we did with uh, the case in Cartesian and polar coordinates, we're going to use orthogonality to find uh, what these coefficients are. And we use orthogonality because that lets us collapse our sum to a single term. And in this case, we wanna use the orthogonality of Bessel functions, which says that if you integrate from zero to uh, 
A, the radius of the cylinder. We're integrating with respect to R to the radius. And this is equal, you increase your Bessel function by an extra order. Alpha and beta are the zeros of the Bessel function. And then you have a conical delta that says that this is only equal to this if we're looking at the same, uh, if alpha is equal to beta. If alpha is not equal to beta, then this is just equal to zero. So this is what the orthogonality condition for Bessel function says. So what we can do then is multiply both sides by R J M beta R over A and integrate. So zero to A, we have Okay, so this is just a term we have here and we're multiplying by, we'll call this alpha n prime or a, integrating with respect to r. Okay, so we've just taken this side, multiplied it by this and integrated from zero to a with respect to r. And then we need to do the same thing on the other side. So you have our constant t naught and the same factor that we added on the left-hand side. We can massage this a little bit. So on the left-hand side, we can take out the sum and the constant factors. We have an R over here our first Bessel function here. And this should be a zero because we only need to, uh, we need to multiply by the same order as this Bessel function. Okay, so this was massaging this side a little bit. And there's not much to do on this side for now. We'll eventually evaluate this integral using the properties outlined in the previous video. Now this is the same form that we have over here for our orthogonality condition for Bessel functions. So we can replace this integral by this expression over here. So a n prime, we still have our coefficients. And this integral is equal to that. So you have a square over two, j one square, alpha n, chronic of delta of this. So it's only one when both these two are equal. And we'll leave this one as is for now. And again, what this chronic delta is gonna do is that it's gonna kill every term except for one when alpha n is equal to alpha n prime. So it's going to collapse the sum into a single term. So we have a n prime prime
how far n prime, let's say. It doesn't matter if we call it alpha n or alpha n prime because for this term, they're equal. Okay, so we're starting to get an expression for our coefficient. We just need to bring this over to this side and evaluate this integral. Okay, so this is what we had in the, at the end of the last page. And now we're going to evaluate this integral. And we can do that based on the properties outlined in the last video, where it says that this would be equal to alpha and alpha and we get an a square over here. We'll get a term that looks like that for our integral. And again, you should be using the properties outlined in the last video to confirm this. So finally, we can bring this over to the other side to find an expression for our coefficients. So this term and this term are the same. So we're left with two t naught a squared. Uh, oh, the a squares cancel out. So alpha n k one alpha n. Okay, so we just brought this over to this side. This is the same as that, so you lose one of the squares, and you're left that you leave. You're left with one in the denominator. Okay, so this is our expression for the coefficients in our superposition. So that means that uh, our solution. given by our coefficients over here. The radial dependence. And the axial dependence, uh, which we call Uh, pipe it. So this is as said over here. Okay, so this is our solution to this problem. So the idea is the same as with every other problem we've done so far. You want to separate variables, uh, or you start out from the general solution that we found, use orthogonality and the principle of superposition to find your coefficients. Uh, so that you can satisfy the boundary conditions. And keep in mind that uh, the alpha n, these are the zeros of the uh, Bessel function of order zero. Okay, so you don't, because this is of order one, you don't get a one over zero over here. Uh, the zeros of the Bessel function of order one are different as you saw in the graphs in the previous video. So that concludes our exploration of 
Laplace's equation in cylindrical coordinates. In the next video, we'll develop the general solution for Laplace's equation in spherical coordinates.